Utah has a per capita death rate from COVID that is far lower than the national average. And according to research from the Chem C. Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah, it may have a lot to do with Utah's younger than average population. The per capita death rate from COVID in Utah is currently 7 per 100,000. Nationwide, the average is 41.3. That is a huge difference, a difference of over 34 points. While many demographic, environmental, and socioeconomic factors most likely play a role in that disparity, the research shows that if Utah's age structure was the same as the United States as a whole, our death rate would rise nearly 50%. And if the U.S. average age was the same as Utah's, the national death rate would drop by nearly a third. This is valuable information because it shows us that policymaking and especially emergency actions need to be highly nuanced and based in what the data shows us. This information also comes amid a growing criticism of government mandates of things like mask wearing and using hand sanitizer without any mention of normal healthy practices like proper eating, exercising, and spending time in the, in the sun, even though it has been firmly established that vitamin D deficiency and obesity are both comorbidities for COVID-19. There is a natural tendency for us all to oversimplify a complicated issue, and COVID-19 is no different. Keep learning, keep reading, and keep listening, and keep talking. Don't just listen, you need to talk too. Welcome to this week's episode of Venture Utah. I am your host, Cameron Porter, owner of Robin Hood Studios. Happy to be here with you today. We've got several great guests with us today. John Pust with Heebie Jeebies Comics and Games and Terrell Wickham with the Sri Center. Our good friend and partner, Joe Rangel, will also be joining us. Alrighty, our first guest this week is John Pust with Heebie Jeebies Comics and Games, correct? It is, yeah. Okay, and he is going to tell us a lot about his journey, uh, how he got started, and how he got to where he is today. So Heebie Jeebies, thank you for being here, first of all. No problem. And Heebie Jeebies Comics and Games, you have multiple locations, is that correct? We do. How many locations do you have? Uh, right now we have three. Okay. Uh, Layton, Ogden, and Logan. Fantastic. So how did you get started? Uh, does not work well with others. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I had kids kind of young and I didn't want to be separated from those kids. So I created a job where I could have them with me every single day. Um, that's, that's the end of it. You know, uh, have a hard time working in structure, but I'm more structured than I ever could have been. Sure. No days off. Right. <laughs> stuck hours all the time, you know, uh, but uh, my failures and my successes are my own, and that's what I needed it, it life to be. So. Okay, so you started. Presumably, you opened up your own shop. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then, and where? What location was that in? Ogden. Ogden's a home location. Okay. We've always been in Ogden. Twenty-five years. This is our twenty-fifth year anniversary. That's incredible. That's awesome. So, twenty-five years. You've gone from one location to three locations at a time. I mean, over the last twenty-five years, so many things have moved to digital. You know, moved to. I mean, even purchasing. Even people who purchase comics often purchase them. Purchase them online. And you've been able to not only stay the same, but expand in that time. So let's talk about when did you, when were you able to open up your second location? So our second location is about 12 years back in Layton. Um, one of our contemporaries was leaving and leaving the area and so we took up his void. Um, and then about 10 years ago uh, we moved into Logan also. Okay, so nice, very nice. And what do you feel like was some of the difference makers? I mean, I guess some of your secrets to success here. How were you able to expand at that time? Uh, really, uh, risk. You just have to embrace the risk. Mm. Just jump at it. Um, the the Leighton location, the second location, was a little scarier than the first location for me because. Uh, the the property management company is for real. They want to take your house if they don't get their mm. rent. So um, <laughs> that's that's kind of a different playing field for me. And in Ogden, you know, you just got good old boy lease where you shake a hand and you and you you sure. pay the guy, and it's not not too big of a deal. Um, but when uh, when, the, when the corporation's breathing down your neck, uh, I, you don't want to lose everything you've built up to that point. Sure, so really. Um, Relying on customer base and loyalty and word of mouth and then having some luck is, is it. I mean, there's, there's not a whole lot of tricks of the trade there, really. Um, 
being kind to people so they come back and, and spread spread the good word. That's all. Well, that's a big deal. Uh, uh, you know, the way that you treat customers, you know, what are your, what you're offering to customers. I mean, 12 years ago, you said you moved to Layton 12 years ago? Yeah. Well, that was 2008. Yeah. That was a terrible time to expand a business. It's always a terrible time to expand business. Uh, okay, it, but it worked so well for you. Yeah. I mean, only two years later, you were opening your third location. Right. And so it was a home run slam dunk move for you. Uh, do you remember, I mean, thinking back then, do you remember what it was? What made you willing to take the risk? Uh, just avoiding stagnation, honestly. Okay. Uh, I think, I think we, we had built kind of a successful model in Ogden. Uh, we kind of, it, it took, took a long way to kind of stumble along and figure out what exactly worked and what didn't. Uh, and you get kind of a confluence of, uh, I don't know, just, just good things that hit all at the same time. And you don't, you don't really have that normally. Um, mm. Who knows what blouses are going to be the best seller this year? So you buy a hundred sure. blouses, right? And, <laughs> and you get stuck with nine. Um, so after we after we kind of whittled it down, um, we're, we're pretty diverse. We, you know, dropping everything under comics and games is, is actually just a huge, huge banner. Really, it's just a giant warehouse of crap that I like. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. I mean, and you know that right there. I think what you hit on is, you know, it's a bunch of it's a big warehouse full of crap that I like. And that's a recognition that you are a representative of a certain demographic. Sure. You're representative of a certain market. And as long as you're being, you know, you're, you're critically evaluating, okay, you know, what, what would I want? If I walked into a store that sold this type of stuff, what would I want to see? That's going to be, I mean, I would assume that would be a really great way to attract people who like the same things as you. Yeah, you would hope so, right? <laughs> you know, and I think, <laughs> and so, you know, I do marketing a lot. I do marketing with clients. I help them, do, you know, figure out how to present themselves. And what I find is I often have to retrain them how to be human. Like, they know what they like. They know what, they, you know, what, what appeals to them. But there's this dot that doesn't connect between what their client is seeing, what their customers are experiencing, and what they would want to experience if they were their own customer. Right. And they don't connect that dot. And it sounds like that you did that. We try, we try and do that on, on the daily. Um, our team, you know, I, I say that exactly. I'm like, hey, don't, don't forget, every morning, walk through the front door, look at the place as though you're a customer. Because mm. we, we get stuck in the same position behind the register, behind the stand. You, you get in your habits. Yeah. We, we want to we wanna be outside of the box and not do that. So you see the weird things or you reorganize. It's like, what, yeah. what attracts your eye as you walk in? Uh, because everyone's first experience is their first experience. And it has to be meaningful. Mm. It has to hopefully last enough that they want to come back. And we have, we have customers that have returned after moving across the country, around the world, having children and their children having children. Um, and and it's, it's really rewarding to have someone telling their kid how much they loved my store when they were a kid. That's fantastic. I love that philosophy. Uh, you have your employees, every time they walk, they come to work, walk in through the front door and just treat it like it's their first time, like right. it's the first time they've walked in. I think that is a, a huge tip for a lot, any, any kind of retail business, but really any business. When you, first, you know, give yourself an opportunity to look at this as if it was your first time, as right. if you are your customer, what are you seeing, what are you experiencing, what could be better? Right. So how is the product offering, or what, the products that you hold, keep in stock, how has that changed over the years? Minimally, you know, I, yeah. I deal in nostalgia. Mm. So um, as, as long as, you know, we're, we're growing lines that, you know, have, have the ability to be grown, um, one day my, my job will, will be done because everything will move digital and paper will be in the past and, and who knows what, what will come know, after maybe. that. <laughs> maybe. I mean, you're right. But... I mean, I think a, a lot of people would have predicted that it, that would have already happened. Oh, I did. There's, there's interviews, yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so another key to success, overwhelming pessimism. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, that's me, yeah. <laughs> that's great. No, so, so you say you, you work in nostalgia, you sell the nostalgia. Uh, what are the biggest movers for you? What kind of products? Um... Boy, it's very trite. There is the, the world's largest collectible card game, Magic the Gathering. Okay. That, that moves a lot. Right now, as everybody is trapped indoors, uh, Dungeons and Dragons kind of um, has the largest renaissance we've seen in, in my career, okay. honestly. Uh, and, and no kidding. Why, why wouldn't it? Let's just sit sure. around a table and play Let's Pretend, you know? Yeah, you got to do something. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty easy. 
Uh, and then um, there, there's not a direct correlation in comic movies and literature, but mm. it reminds people. Sure. Uh, there, are, there are plenty of webtoons and things that, that uh, younger people are seeing on, on Instagram or TikTok or whatever that tell them that there's other things out there and they come looking for it and that's, that's excellent. Okay. What's really interesting is that, you know, the first couple things you mentioned, you know, Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons. I actually have a buddy who's starting a business being a dungeon master mm -hmm. uh, for new groups. Kind of like, I mean, he would be competing with like axe throwing and bowling and like sure. those types of events, but he would go to the house and actually dungeon master for a group of people for their first time or their second time. Or, Interesting you know, or, and creepy. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would love that characterization. Let me into your house. <laughs> it's like, I'll be your dungeon I'll master. I'll teach you. <laughs> <laughs> Got to make sure that the website there is very clear on exactly <laughs> what he is offering and what he's not offering. <laughs> oh, that's great. But... Uh, you know, those two things, those are recent things. Those aren't so much like the old, you know, the old Super Nintendo or regular Nintendo or the Atari or anything like that. Oh, so much older. Yeah. Well, Dungeons and Dragons started in 1973. Well, but it's a modern phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's as much modern as it is classic. Sure. You know, whereas, you know, so would you say that nostalgia is still, even though Dungeons and Dragons and Magic are, like I said, modern, they're still, they still have active development going on. Would you say that the primary movers of that is still nostalgia? Mm, yes and no. So I think, I think all of us kind of harken back to what was fun, what we liked, what was a good time, because we have so much pressing down on us all the time. Um, and while, while we have a cell phone in our pocket and it's easy to be distracted, that's not necessarily fun. So whether you played D&D &D in high school or you played Magic in college, mm. uh, it, it still is a harkening back. Um, mm. and, and I see that in a lot of our different departments in what's important to people. You know, we'll have people just killing me for some obscure movie, but it was their favorite movie at whatever point in their life where <laughs> things were good for them, most likely. Gotcha, that's really interesting. And now that you mentioned that, you know, I, I do play video games, but the games that I play are the games that I played when I was a kid. <laughs> and I, I don't really play them for nostalgia, but I, enjoy, I play them because I enjoy them. Right. But I think I enjoy them because I enjoyed them as a child. Right. You know, and, and that's, uh, how I grew into those. So what are the addresses? What's your address for your Ogden location? Uh, it's 2262 Washington. It's right downtown. Oh, nice. Perfect. And that is a plug, a historic building that we worked on for nearly three years and renovated ourselves. Wow. So uh, that's our base forever until I'm done. Uh, so or until we should, nuclear shouldn't be going anywhere, honestly. <laughs> uh, it's a phenomenal... 1898 uh, building. Wow. Um, yeah, come check it out. That's awesome. So the 22 what? 62. 2262. 2262 Washington in Ogden. Right. And uh, is there a best way for people to reach out with questions? Uh, the website. Okay. Facebook. Um, just phone call to the Ogden store. Uh, we, we field nearly constant phone calls. It's pretty, pretty <laughs> discouraging. No. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I, I, Sometimes we're just a call center. My goodness. Yeah, no. Um. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for being here, John. I think yeah, this was a for great conversation. Me. Hey. All righty. Our next guest this week is Terrell Wickham with the SRI Center. She's going to talk to us a little bit about the retreats that she has to offer and teach us some techniques for coping with the huge amount of stress that we have in our lives as business owners. Terrell, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. Oh, it's so good to have you here. We've known each other for a long time. Yes. And, and it's great to have you here. And I know the incredible value and wisdom that you have to offer. But first, let's convince the audience. Tell us a little bit about uh, your background. My background. Um, actually, I'm going to begin by sharing a little bit about how I got into what I'm doing and, and how I found this. Or really, I should say this found me. Um, I had a near-death experience about 16 years ago mm. and when I chose back to come into life again I realized that I needed a purpose in addition to being a mother and I felt this really strong calling to honor the love that I have for serving people for helping people and it's just brought so much joy into my life that I can't imagine doing anything else, to be honest with you. It's just, it's so rewarding for me. And then to be able to see 
the benefits that people experience lifelong by diving into their shadow work, by taking some breaths, by writing in their journal, some basic things that people really, I think, need to be doing on a daily basis. And each person is so unique that I think it's really important to fine tune what you specifically need to do for yourself mm. to find that center and to find that grounding point within yourself before you start your day. And it's like you plant a seed and then throughout the day as life feels stressful, it's like, oh yeah, I have my breath. You take a nice, slow, deep breath and you do that three times and then it resets you. Sometimes we do some tapping on the body, just like come back to myself. We can come up with like a mantra or a word that really anchors in that self-love or your intention for the day. And then the rest of your day, you can just kind of breeze through life, whatever comes to you, whatever tornadoes or hurricanes are around you, you know, having a house full of kids or or working with people that are kind of chaotic or traffic, all of those situations and many, many more things that are happening in this world specifically today, we can always come back to our own breath and our own awareness of self. And I think that's really powerful. So mm. I have found a lot of benefit doing that for myself. And so I like to share that with people and help them fine tune their own mm. personal like 10 minute practice in the mornings. Absolutely, and I think, yeah. it, just touching on a couple of things that you pointed out, you know, to point it out, you know, centering yourself before the day begins. And, yes. Uh, and there's certain, there's very little simple things that you can do mm -hmm. to recenter yourself. And it's actually very similar, I think, in principle to, to, to meditation, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, and yeah. even if they're skeptical of it, like it's something that they can, that they can approach. Yes. And, med and meditation, my understanding of meditation, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but my understanding of meditation is that you're basically trying not to think. You're trying to empty your mind mm -hmm. and just, just, just be at complete peace and calm for a little while. Mm -hmm. And what I found helps me do that is focusing on my breathing, mm -hmm. listening to myself breathe. Listening to your breath is essential. Okay, so yes. sweet. Yes, you're muddling doing my it way right, through. Cameron, way to go. <laughs> So, and yes. I, you know, and things that you're talking about, it's interesting, like something as simple as, you know, tapping yourself. You mentioned yeah. tapping yourself several times. Yeah. And taken out of context, that may seem a little bit strange. Mm -hmm. And it may seem mm -hmm. even hokey. Yeah. But if you understand what is happening and the effect that it has, yeah. and you let it have that effect on you, I think that's a big part of it, is mm -hmm. you have to, you treat it like the same way you would treat a meditation. Or, you have to be open yeah. to it. Yeah. You have to be open to it. And it's all free. Everything I mentioned is completely free. Mm -hmm. And we want to go out and, you know, I need to relax. And we go to the bar or we, you know, people will go turn on the TV and buy a movie or buy out, take out food. And it's like, that costs money. But this is free. And what the, th the thing that I really love and appreciate is that um, there's a difference between prayer and meditation. Hmm. So praying is actually asking for support, for guidance, and putting your intentions and prayers out there. And meditation is receiving and being hmm. open to the information that Spirit, God, Heavenly Father, the universe, whatever it is you believe in, has to give you. And so I love combining the two. I think praying and meditation both are so beautifully married hmm. that we can't do one without the other authentically. And they're really intertwined. It's just I'm going to specifically say prayer and meditation. And you pointed out that it's uh, that what you offer or the things that you've talked about already, they're free. Yeah. And I think that's an advantage to them. I think an even greater advantage, and maybe this is a good time to talk about your retreats and how what you help people do in your retreats, sure. because another advantage of a coping mechanism such as meditation or yeah. things like that is that it's not a dis you're not distracting yourself from what's stressing you out and taking a break from it, you're addressing it. You're facing it directly and taking the time to address what's stressing you out. And so it's more of a long-term solution. Bingo. And is, it, is that one of the things you focus on with your retreats? That's the number one thing I focus on. So people come to me that have these um, patterns or habits that they can't get out of and then they keep looping through it. You know, like food or alcohol or cannabis or some things that are like, maybe non-working behaviors that we all do. We mm. all do it. It can be TV, mm. it can be 
um, getting busy, you know, we, we all do it, or spending money, and it's facing into why. So it's what, the, what is the root reason why I feel drawn to this particular behavior? And I think it's really important to look at the why. Until we do, we can't pull that weed out and plant new seeds. There's no way we can do that. So my job is to support them to see what patterns, I mean, they come ready to know the, the things that they want to shift. And mm -hmm. then there's a lot of surprises along the way. Like, I want to stop smoking. Okay, so let's talk about why you're smoking. Well, I'm anxious. And there's a lot of reasons. They say there's nine reasons why we do some kind of behavior that isn't working for us. It's a sabotaging behavior. And it just takes us away from who we are as a core being, who God created us to be. It takes us away from that. So it's really important to look at why we're doing it and, and try to um, isolate and identify all of the reasons why we're drawn to doing that behavior. And then once we look at that, a lot of times there's like childhood trauma that comes into it, um, relationship issues, or some kind of, some kind of um, trauma or drama that's happened to us that's caused us to behave a certain way. And so what do we do? We wanna come back to that God self, that, that um, self that's whole and complete and balanced place, and then come up with behaviors that we can do instead of smoking or drinking or whatever it is. We come up with an actual template of things that we can do on a daily basis to support us to stay in that place of stillness. That's really awesome. Yeah, and I do, love it. <laughs> do you find, as you're working with people, uh, and this is a, a genuine question, is most of the time, so, so when someone's just dealing with stress, it's not maybe yeah. not a necessarily an addictive or destructive behavior that they're trying to change. Yeah. They're just trying to cope with everything going on in their life. Yeah. Do you find that the root cause of their stress is truly the external things that they're focused on or is it usually something internal? That's a genuine question. Um, I think it's both. Okay. I think that we tend to get out of ourselves and focus on what's happening, all the distractions, because it's shiny. The lights are shiny. The kids are screaming. It's happening right now. We need to pay attention to it right now, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, that is what takes us out of the moment. But then there's that internal conflict that's happening inside that causes us to react. So we really don't have control over what we're feeling. All we have control over is how we respond to what we feel. So some people just don't handle and manage stress very well. Well, And that is um, depending upon your nervous system, kind of your parents and how they dealt with stress. Um, there's a lot of factors on how we manage stress, but right now is a very stressful time in the world in general. And it's especially important that we find, again, our morning practice of prayer and meditation, our um, tapping, our breath, our exercise, things that we do to come back to that still place within ourselves so that as stress piles up throughout the day, then we're able to bring it down. And even if we are managing stress instead of being like a nine out of 10, we're handling it around a five out of 10, and then eventually a four, and then a three, and then a two, and a one. So it's, it's, it's gonna take time. This is a journey. It's not something that's gonna just happen. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. healed, I'm fixed. There's no magic pill. Mm -hmm. As long as we're breathing, we're always gonna have something to work on. That's the bottom line. I love it. Yeah. So real quick, uh, you mentioned a, a number of things at the beginning there, and I think you just touched on one big one. As far as what business owners can do on their own to kind of, uh, to, to achieve more of what they can achieve, more of their potential and, yeah. and defeat that stress and manage that stress and that overwhelm. You mentioned a morning routine. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Wait, essential, essential. Mm. And then, uh, so morning routine, and the goal of the morning routine is to to really come back to who you are as an individual. We all have so many hats that we're wearing mm. and it doesn't matter what job we have or what responsibilities we have, we all only have 24 hours in a day. So how are you going to manage your time? And we can be house broke, car broke, or overwork ourselves, but when it comes to the end of the day, we're the ones that look ourselves in the mirror we're the ones that come back to the higher power and say, how did I do today being of service to other people? And that is another way to get out of being selfish is serving, 
right? Who can I help today? That is a great way of staying present and connected to our peace. I love so, it. So sorry, I keep throwing things out there. I no, just I great. love this topic. So so yeah, as far as owning yeah. a business or or um, yeah, especially owning a business because there's so much responsibility involved in that, it's really important to come back to the why. Why am I doing this? And how is it connected to, I call it my dharmic path or um, my God-given gifts, my talents, what, what I've been blessed to um, share with the world. How is what I'm doing on path or on track to who I'm here to be? Mm. And if, it, if we can't find purpose in what we're doing, then we really need to be st um, spending more time meditating and coming into a retreat mode. That's when you go away and you take your journal and you turn off your phone and you really need to start digging in there. I love it. So, Unfortunately, that's all the time we've got today. Okay. Uh, but for people who would like to reach out, maybe learn more about the ret retreats that you do, yeah. what's the best way to contact you? I would say email me, terrellsings at gmail.com, um, Facebook, Terrell Wickham, or okay. the Shree Center on Facebook. Perfect. That's probably one of the best ways too. Thank you so much for okay. being here. Thank you for allowing me to be here. No problem. Alrighty, our last guest this week is Joe Rangel, longtime friend and partner of the show with To Evolve Coaching and Consulting. Joe, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So today, uh, what we wanted to talk about, uh, you mentioned was uh, the process of getting more aware of your thoughts and how annoying that can actually be. Is that correct? It is, and yes, and it can be. <laughs> um, you know, part, a big part of what we teach is the understanding of the thought processes that drive behavior patterns. Most of us know the things that we do, you know, the things that get in the way. A lot of us don't know why they get in the way, like why we do the things we do. Hmm. Okay. So what we do, as you know, is help people understand their subconscious thought processes so that they can learn to shift those into balance and then live a better life but mm. that process of of awareness can be quite annoying i saw a graph a long time ago i think i think i saw it in something that cubby did that says that we go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence to unconscious competence oh, okay and unconscious competence would be developing those new habits that lead you along a better way i'm not so sure we ever completely get to you know, unconscious competence. I think we're probably in high levels of conscious competency where we're choosing better choices, hopefully. But there's that vacillation stage where you're vacillating between conscious incompetence and conscious competence that can be quite annoying. Mm. And a lot of times we'll make choices and realize in retrospect that we could have maybe made a better choice. That's the, that's the annoying part. And I think it, it what I'm getting, at least if I'm taking your meaning correctly, I'm kind of applying it to myself and thinking about what I've personally experienced. And it can be frustrating and discouraging to really have your eyes opened to how imperfect you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you you, ha you kind of go through life with this sense of, hey, you know, like I'm not perfect, but I do a pretty good job. I do, do my best, right? And, and then you actually have your eyes open as you're, t as you're consciously evaluating the decisions you make and, the, and why you make those decisions and you start recognizing in yourself all of the things you hate about other people. Kind of the things <laughs> that you kind of maybe don't like about you. Maybe. Yeah, and then and you, see, you, you see all that and yeah, it can be discouraging and annoying is a, is a good way to put it because it's not so drastic and it seems, you know, you can conquer something that's annoying. Right. It's, it's harder to conquer something that's devastating or something like that. So I think calling it annoying is putting it in its place. But is that what you're talking about, that phenomenon? Yeah, and I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I have a belief that we are perfect, but not in the earthly sense of perfect. You know, we try to constantly measure up against other things. And in that realm, I, I believe we're constantly going to be imperfect. I think Einstein said that the struggle for perfection yields excellence. We can be the most excellent people we can be, but we're not going to be perfect in this, this gauge of perfection that exists in the world. And yet, we're already perfect masterpieces of creation, each one of us. If we can kind of own that, I came out with a shirt, a t-shirt a long time ago that said, I'm perfectly perfect in my imperfection. <laughs> because the fact is, is we do have a process of perfection through life and experiences and sometimes bad choices and things that don't go right. And so, yeah, yeah. And it's and understanding why you do what you do can be really important. But it also, again, on another side of it can be frustrating because now 
when you understand you have control of your thoughts, right, and you take personal responsibility for your life, then you start to go, well, I can't say they made me mad anymore. I made me mad based on a perception of what they said or did. You can't say somebody hurt your feelings. I allowed my feelings to get hurt based on my perception of what they said or what they did. Those types of things, and we start to look at it and we go, oh, man, it sucks to be personally responsible for everything in my life, but it's also hugely liberating. Because mm. once you start to realize that everything's your choice, nothing can kind of suck you down that rabbit hole, unless you let it. Yeah, that, I'm not sure why, but that makes me think of the difference between you know, someone, the, the old saying, sticks and, sticks and stones may break, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And I think uh, there's, the, the, the truth to that is, you know, you don't really have a choice as to how your body's going to respond if you get punched in the face. Like, let's be honest. I mean, sure, maybe if you've trained yourself, you have the reflexes, you see it coming, you can react differently. But point being, if that fist makes contact with your face at a certain velocity, your body will react in a specific way because that's a physical occurrence. But when someone says something to you or does something that makes you feel a certain way or causes you to want to make yourself feel a certain way, you have the choice of how to respond to it. And you can train yourself to, have, to, to be able to have more control over that choice where you don't get hijacked early on and you can make the choice. So that's what that made me think of. I don't know if that's the direction you were going with it. Well, um, it could be, but so let me ask you this. What would you do if somebody punched you in the face? What would your body do? my cheek would most likely bruise, my jaw might break, depending on where they hit. Is, is but you that, do have a choice if you're going to hit them back or not. True. I mean, yeah, yeah, response right. there. As far as, you know, what you do in response, response you, de you definitely have reaction, choices there. Yeah. Right? So I, I was not consciously aware in high school, um, but I had my own agenda, and I remember one time I had just been in trouble. I just got suspended for getting in a fight. <clears throat> Imagine that. <laughs> and uh, and this and then th I, this girl wanted to go out with me, and I said I'd go to a concert with her. It was, I even remember it was the Rush concert, since we were just talking about Neil Peart recently. Um, and then he got mad. He said, "You can't take my girlfriend to this concert." And I was like, "She wants to go." And I was in band, but I was kind of a kind of a bad boy band bird, and this guy was a hood, <laughs> you know. And he came out and he picked a fight in front of the band uh, building. And I never forget it because I practiced restraint, which I usually did not during those mm. days. But I had just got back in school. And he goes, well, you're going to fight me. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to fight you. I just got back in school. And he, he punched me. He did. He punched me in the face, in the cheek. And, I, and he goes, come on, you're going to fight me. And I just sidestepped him. He went to kick me, and I stepped back, and I was holding my trumpet in my hand. I was like, um, And then he ended up coming and trying to, I think he was trying to tackle me. And I ended up grabbing him a headlock and throwing him on the ground, and then I, I walked in the building and let it go. That's the most vivid remember, remembrance I have in my life of practicing restraint. But, but it wasn't to not get in a fight. No, per se. It was to not get in a fight so I wouldn't get suspended again and get in trouble. Because like when we go to school, when we're in school, if you get in a fight, the person that threw the punch is not the only person that gets in a fight. The person that hit back gets in a fight too. And I mean, they get in trouble too. So yeah, I am talking about that. You're right. We don't have a choice in physical response, like what happens, a bruise or you know, a cut or whatever. We do have, though, the choice to respond in the way that we're going to. And response is usually better than reaction. So if you think about responding, you know, that tends to come from a more love-based, compassionate, compassionate premise. Reaction tends to be more fear-based, just like it sounds, reactionary, to an outside stimuli. Mm. But the more we can learn that, the more balanced that we can become in life. Although, I will tell you, as you're learning it, it, can, it is. It's very frustrating. And even though I practice this stuff all the time every day, I have moments where, you know, I wake up on the wrong side of the bed and go, gosh, what's going on? You know, what's making me feel just grumpy, for lack of a better word? And that happened to me just this last week. I just celebrated, not celebrated, I celebrated a five-year anniversary of my son getting treatment. 
don't know if you saw the post or not, but yeah, I did. Five years ago on August eighth, you know, he was the best he could have ever been. He had just come out of a treatment facility. He was happy and bright and healthy, and and then six months to the day, he died. And mm -hmm. so I found myself feeling a little, I think, apprehensive at that that day, August eighth which was the six months since he had passed away on February 8th. And it took me a little while to realize what was bugging me, you know, why I was just in this funk. And, uh, and I remember my wife asking me, what would you do if, if you were talking to a client? What would you tell them to do? And usually when somebody's in a bad space, the best thing that you can do to help yourself is to get up and go help someone else. Because a lot of times in those moments, we can't help ourselves. We can't, we're like, bleh. I just, want to read a book and stay grumpy and not deal with anybody. But if we can reach out to other people and help them, it can start a process of helping yourself. And I did that and within, you know, so luckily within an hour or so, it was able to shift that versus years ago, I might have been stuck there for weeks, months. Mm. So. Wow. I think, yeah, it comes down to your ability to control how you're going to respond. You know, and then that's the nice thing about uh, words uh, or other happenings as opposed to, you know, a physical altercation. Is it, it's, you, you don't even have to let it harm you. I mean, so, some things are going to happen, they just happen, and they harm you physically, financially, or otherwise. Right. But, you know, if it's, if it's just an interpersonal issue, you can choose, you have control over whether it harms you at all. Right. and control over whether or over how you respond to it. I think that's, that's my takeaway from the conversation. I don't know if that's what you were going for. No, it is. It's, and understanding that that can be difficult at times. You know, mm. th there might be times that you logically know that better choice and still make the emotional reactionary choice and go, ah, I know better than that. You know, I could have done something different. But that's life, right? The, the, that's life. The process of conscious continued evolution, which is what I, that's what I work on teaching people all the time, every day. So for people who want to get in touch with you, just a quick reminder, what's the best way to reach out? www.2evolvecoaching.com. That's the number two, evolvecoaching.com. Or they can call out. I'm give my cell number easily. So it's 801-850-2974. You can call or text. Um, really, yeah, you can actually, anybody can set an appointment with me or Scott, my other coach, on our website. They can take our free assessment and begin to start changing their life, if they want to. Awesome, thank you so much for being here, Joe. Thanks, Cameron, appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. And that is it for this week's episode of Venture Utah. Thank you for joining us, and we'll catch you next week.